Learn about annuals adapted to growing in full sunlight. The calibricoas are a great plant out there in the sun. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight on our show, we'll go into the greenhouse with extension horticulturalist David Graper to learn which annuals are best suited for sunny areas. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts will answer your question. So get ready to call in. The panelists are here with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insects, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden related concerns. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions is John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, SDSU Horticulture Department Head and Extension Horticulturalist, Larry Osborne, Extension Plant Pathologist, and Mike Mechning, Extension Weed Specialist. You can start calling in now with your questions. The phone number for you to call in with your lawn and garden questions is 1-866-595 SDSU. Again, that is 1-866-595-7378. Helping to answer the phones tonight are the folks from the Brookings Area Master Gardeners. And remember, when you call in with your questions, please provide our phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. We be ready to provide a description of the problem, when the problem first appeared, whether it's affecting any other surrounding plants and moisture and or soil conditions that exist as well. First off, we're going to go around the table to hear from our panel what is currently happening, starting with uh, John Keekafer. So, John, what is happening in our insect world? Well, I brought one tonight that's not really an insect, but it gets lumped in there for a lot of people. They think of anything with legs and being kind of small and crunchy as being about the same sort of thing. <laughs> So I brought in a couple images of ticks. Uh, I think probably everyone on the panel is happy I didn't bring the real thing. This is just an example of a place where you'd be likely to find ticks around here. We get a lot of comments from people who insist that ticks like to live in trees. They like those wooded areas, and you can see there are some trees in the background here. And if you look really closely, there is actually a tick on a blade of grass in the center of this image. This is pretty typical of a place where you'd find them. They like those areas right on the edges of woods. They like to uh, to hang out in those places where deer and other animals will kind of move through there. And uh, if we go to the next one, you can see they, they end up sitting on the grass blades or on other low growing plants. And as an animal comes by, they reach out and catch them with a leg or a foot, if you will. And as soon as they get a hold of them with one of those, they just let go with the others and transfer onto that creature. A lot of cases it's humans, and so we worry about disease transmission a little bit if they do end up being on humans. This particular tick is one of our common ones around here. This is one, some people <coughs> call them wood ticks, some people call them American dog ticks. Derma center variabilis is the, the name on these guys and these are the ones that you typically find in South Dakota. They do transmit some diseases. Rocky Mountain spotted fever is probably the most common of the diseases that they transmit. Um, there are some others out there as well too and so you do want to make sure that you get ticks removed from you if you find them on yourself and there are some products out there to keep them off of a person. The permethrin products are probably the most common ones right now. You can buy clothing that is already uh, soaked in permethrin if you will. It's treated with that permethrin so that that product stays on there and repels and kills some of those ticks or you can do it yourself by buying the product and applying it to your clothing. Okay, thanks John. Question I have for you though is that question of if you find a tick and it may be attached fairly well or fairly well 
getting there to where it's going to be attached, what's the best way or what you recommend to take that off? Or is there caution or issues with, with removing that tick? There is a little bit of caution with that. You'd want to try to remove it by the head, grabbing as close to that head as you can and getting down close to the skin and getting it off of there. A nice pair of forceps or a pair of tweezers you know, right at that head so you don't squeeze the body and squeeze all of the gut contents back into your into yourself and doing that is kind of the trick you don't want to distribute any more of those things than than you can help doing. What about fingernail polish or a hot match? Um, you know honestly I had one professor who described the hot match technique as being very similar to if you were to get burned and if you were attached your immediate reaction would be to scream and everything on the inside of you comes right back out and in this case ticks actually cement their mouth parts into the skin so they They've got kind of a three-part mouth part, and the two sides go out, and they use a cement to glue themselves in there. So if that happens, everything in the gut ends up going into your skin. Okay. So your best bet really is just getting them by the head and uh, removing them as soon as possible. Okay, good. Thanks, Jeff. Dave, what do you have for us tonight? Ooh, a bouquet. I brought a little bouquet for <laughs> you, Steve. <laughs> and I thought I'd bring a bouquet of some of the less common flowering woody plants. The crab apples are about ready to pop. Maybe they already have down in Sioux Falls. Uh, lots of other spring flowering woody plants out there. But uh, I brought a few along from McCroy today that maybe are a little bit different that maybe some folks don't have in their, in their yards. And this first one is probably the most unusual one of the group. And these are going to be a little bit difficult to see maybe. I've tried taking pictures of these, but they're kind of small. This is a little pl woody plant called Epimedium. It's a, a kind of a, a semi-woody ground cover. Uh, we have a few plants growing in our uh, perennial garden along the edge. Gets these cute little heart-shaped leaves on it later in the season. But it starts with this flower spike that comes up and they're really pretty delicate little flowers. These come in yellow, pink, red, and white. Uh, I say not a very common plant. You're gonna probably have to do a little searching to find this. Uh, check with some of your local garden centers and they might have this. Otherwise you might have to just order these uh, online or from a mail order catalog or something like that. This next one is also a little bit unusual. We don't see a lot of these around. We're starting to see more of these as I'm spreading petals around here. This is the Eastern Redbud. And we've got a few of these at McCroy. And you'll probably see more of these down around the Sioux Falls area. But a very lovely uh, relative of the pea family, or group of the, a member of the pea family, has these little pea-like flowers that develop along the twig. The interesting thing about this is the flowers come out first. As you can see, they're just kind of popping out along the side of the twig. And these will be on some pretty good sized branches even where the flowers will pop out along the twig. And they just put on a beautiful display. And these are just beginning to open up now. Uh, we've got a few of these trees around the Brookings area. Like I say, you'll probably see more of them if you get down around Sioux Falls. And uh, this is a selection out of Minnesota. If you go further south, like say down to Kansas or Missouri or something like that, this is a very common plant growing in the understories around uh, the forest dairies and, and so forth in those areas. A nice small sized uh, landscape plant. I wouldn't try very much further north or too much further west of, of Brookings here, but uh, a little bit on the southeastern corner of the part of the state. Kind of a nice plant to give a try, not on a large scale, but uh, try a few of these. This next is another relatively small plant. This is the Saskatoon or service berry, also called June berry. It's in full bloom right now here in Brookings. Uh, really pretty little white flowers. This is followed by small blueberry-like fruit that it gets on, and they usually ripe about in June, uh, hence the name Juneberry. Uh, I've had trouble trying to get a taste of these. The birds usually get them before I get a chance to pick them. We've got a few of these. Uh, there's a nice big plant outside of the Biostress building where I, my office is. And you'll see more and more of these around, but a very interesting plant, multi-stem plant usually. Small plant for a small yard, pretty flowers, attractive and delicious fruit, and also usually some good fall color to it. So a really nice uh, small plant that you might want to give a try. And this one that I'm dripping petals all over the place, this is the Star Magnolia, or Magnolia stellata. Another small plant, good for just about any uh, size yard again. Brookings area is kind of the northern limit for this. Certainly does pretty well down in the Sioux Falls and southeastern corner of the state. Uh, and we've got four or five other varieties of magnolia that we're trying out at McCrory, and they've been kind of slow getting started. This is a slow-growing plant. 
We had a big one here in Brookings that was maybe, I don't know, 15, 18 feet tall or so, and was probably 30 years old. So not a very fast growing plant, but a beautiful plant in the spring, one of our first spring blooming uh, shrubs in the area. And this last one is just an example of one of the rhododendrons that we have at McCrory. And I, I apologize, I tried to write down the name on a little piece of paper and that piece, piece of paper got kind of wet, but this is, I think, Costarianus uh, is the hybrid that this is, but there's several other uh, magnolias out there. Not the best plant to try for everyone. You need some acidic soils. Uh, they've been doing more work with some of these. In Minnesota, there's the whole light series. We've got some of those. Those are deciduous azaleas. This is an evergreen azalea. A lot of people get excited about azaleas and rhododendrons. They see them further south. They're out on the east coast, but try them with caution here in, in South Dakota. You got to have just the right spot for them. Otherwise, they can be very frustrating for you. Okay. Shade on those rhododendrons? Well, I've got ours planted in kind of part shade. Uh, what they've been telling us in Minnesota is that the light series that they developed out there, they're planting them in full sun now. Mm. So you have to kind of try them out. We put them underneath some pine trees, not because of the acid soil, but it was near the front entrance and we got some dappled light coming through the pines. But um, you know, try a plant or two and see how they do. But I wouldn't go out and buy a dozen of them or anything. It's just not a real reliable plant for us. Okay, good. But pretty this, when they bloom. The service berry, if you can beat mm -hmm. the birds and the animals to that fruit, is that the ones where you can leave the nuts right in the fruit and cook it yep. in the pie? Yep, you okay. just pick them just like blueberries yeah. and, and yeah. use them. I, I know John Ball swears by them that it's some of the best pie he's ever had, so. but I've never had enough berries to make a pie, so <laughs> <laughs> I've got three plants at home, but the birds get the fruit before I do usually, so I usually get like one or two and it's like, oh, they already got them. So. Okay. Well, at least it all, a good array of colors too, so you can, we yes. can see how we can really yeah. color there's up. There's a lot more out there plants. than the lilacs and the crab apples. A lot of people have those, but there's a lot of other interesting plants that we can try here okay. too. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Larry, yes, sir. Uh, this isn't from golfing, is it? As far well, as a divot or anything, or been a busy day. Okay, a busy day in uh, Brookings, uh, and I, uh, I was in uh, the clinic earlier today, and it has been turf, 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 turf. I think uh, you're partly to blame. I think you uh, brought some of these up from Minnehaha County last week. Uh, what I have with us today in the studio, and I want to talk about especially, is thatch buildup in our especially in our bluegrass lawns, but also potentially in some of the fine leaf fescues. What I have here is an example of a sample that came in. I'm, I'm going to just turn it gently to show the top, and you see an excellent sample. Uh, this person brought in, and the sample actually was much larger. It was about a 9x9, nine nine, uh, maybe a cake pan size. But you see uh, fairly healthy tissue, uh, turf on this side, and the, the problem area. The margin is what we like to see. That way we can find any actively growing fungi and problems that might be in the soil. But fungus is not what the main problem is uh, with this turf today. If you look closely, in this soil profile, there really isn't much soil. Uh, this is about uh, two inches of solid thatch. You have root mass down here, but it's not down into the soil. And up here you have stems and old dead leaves and crowns of the plants. Okay. Define thatch. Thatch is really just the dead, uh, the dead tissue from the above ground portions of the plant, as well as some of the dead and dying roots that have knitted together, like a thatched roof, you might think of it that way. It's knitted together to really insulate the, uh, the, the roots of this plant from the air, so they're not breathing well, and also the soil isn't receiving the water and the nutrients that we apply. So this is a problem in many, many different ways. The plant here, the roots are surviving in that top half inch or inch of, of space. And so if you water this every day and, and are able to spoon feed nitrogen to this plant, the top of that plant might do okay. But that day, that hot day in the summer when you forget to water, look out. This is what happened here in this turf. This, this home uh, transferred from what I call someone who loves their lawn to death. Uh, they were watering every day and applying far too much fertilizer and uh, came into possession of, uh, of a person who was a little more rational, uh, watering every week or, or twice a week deeply to try and get that water down into the roots. Uh, the problem was the thatch was already there. So I wanted to, the, the slides I have tonight just show you some of the thatch uh, buildup problems that we have. There on the, on the left of your screen, you see the, the excessive thatch in that uh, core. A couple of soil probes, one uh, sample on the left hand uh, core there shows about two or two and a half inches of thatch uh, versus a little more appropriate 
sized layer, you can see some root tissue going down into the soil there. So that's what thatch buildup looks like. And I think the next uh, uh, slide shows what this will lead to. Again, shallow rooting. So when we get the heat, heat of the day and the sunny weather in the middle of the summer, uh, it's going to bake those roots and you're going to end up with drought stress, drought prone lawns, buildup of lots of fungi, especially necrotic ring spot and summer patch. Those two uh, really love the thatch layer and overall just a higher maintenance cost uh, due to the water uh, use and nitrogen and everything else. Too much nitrogen, again loving the lawn to death, is going to encourage uh, overgrowth in the top and less rooting. Infrequent mowing, meaning you're taking off more than a third of that plant and uh, not often enough you're, you're putting large chunks of dead material in, back into that uh, thatch layer and you're also encouraging more coarse uh, tissue. Overwatering, you're keeping those roots high in the soil profile and that's not necessarily good. Also uh, a compacted soil that the roots aren't able to penetrate and then sometimes we get a little happy with the pesticides and it, and it uh, alters the soil microbial state. How to get rid of the thatch layer, uh, it's going to take some time. This is not a quick fix, but we first of all recommend core aeration. And on a well-maintained or a highly managed uh, bluegrass lawn, every year you're going to need to do something like this. Core aeration, uh, recommend early fall, but if you've got a problem like this, now is the best time to do it. We've got a few more weeks of nice weather. You can probably still get away with a springtime uh, core aeration or even a power raking. But beware, you're going to damage the turf whenever you do that vertical mowing. And you see that machine on the left, you can rent from your garden center. Um, another uh, remedy might be top dressing with some soil that's very similar to what you have. But keep that light. Uh, a way of top dressing is to take those cores and leave them on the soil surface and maybe rake them in just a little bit. Uh, in a way of preventing this, more frequent mowing, mowing that lawn so you're not taking any more than a third of the, the, the top growth off at any one time. Deeply water this turf, maybe once or twice a week at the most. Uh, get that uh, water profile filled, the soil profile filled, and then stop watering until that uh, dries down uh, several inches. Maybe a slow release nitrogen product is optimal for these highly managed turfs. Uh, that's going to help just a little bit uh, with the nitrogen balance. And then, of course, take a soil test to determine how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium you actually need. Those P and K nutrients are actually very important for rooting. Uh, plants and the nitrogen really encourages a lot of top growth. So uh, just remember uh, we can love our lawn to death uh, and that's what a lot of growers in, around the state have done. Uh, I hate to say it but it is uh, a bigger problem in our urban centers. Um, uh, typical uh, farm lawn is not usually that well maintained but also we don't see the thatch build up in those places. Okay, but some thatch is okay. A little thatch is just great. Yeah. It makes the lawn a little more uh, forgiving, it's a little spongy, uh, and it actually helps uh, seal the soil uh, from too much evaporation and, and helps uh, protect those roots in the heat of the day. Okay. And as far as core aeration, what we're talking about there is the machines that take a core out, just not a spike that right. makes a hole. We actually want to take a core soil right. out of the hole. Okay. Bringing some of that soil yeah. up, and that's very difficult when you have two inches of thatch to get through. You got to make sure that core aerator is set deeply to bring up at least an inch or two of soil, and that, that will spread out on top of the thatch and put microbes there to help degrade the thatch from the top and so gives the roots some air. As heavy as that is with thatch, could they go over it twice? They're going to have to go with over this machine? one probably with a power rake and a core aerator. Okay. I think they're going to really need to remove a lot of this tissue. Uh, this lawn has some anthracnose and some other fungi building up in that thatch layer and they're going to want to do some uh, major renovation right away this year because their lawn is dead. They're going to need to power rake, uh, I imagine, and get that thatch composted or get it off. Um, and then along with the power raking, just to aerate and allow those roots to penetrate a little more deeply. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Mike, what do we have for weeds this week? Well, this week we've got crabgrass. I've been kind of telling everybody, wait, you know, the crabgrass is not emerging yet. Just wait on your crabgrass preventers, your crabgrass herbicides. And I was out this weekend, and sure enough, there's crabgrass. And we always say, you know, the best time to put on your crabgrass preventers in the spring is when the lilacs bloom. And I noticed Dave didn't have any lilacs in his collection because they're not out yet. But crabgrass, if you had it last year, uh, kind of a low-growing grass like this, has those finger-like uh, uh, heads, seed heads on it. 
uh, growing around. If you had that last year, uh, you're going to want to start treating for that now before it emerges. So that's one thing to be looking for. Uh, next picture, this is what I saw this weekend um, in a sunny, bare soil spot, a lot warmer than the rest of the, the yard. Uh, we've got crabgrass already starting to come up. So you definitely want to get your crabgrass preventers on before the crabgrass comes up. And so you probably still have time to do that. Some options uh, might be your, um, uh, there's a, you know, pendimethalin, dithiopyr are two common options. I kind of like the dithiopyr, look around on the bags. Uh, you, you might see either one. Um, but they all work fairly well. Key is, is to get it on before the crabgrass emerges, which is right about now. But uh, I don't know if you could see in the background of that previous picture though, I mean, the, the um, lilacs are just budding right now. I mean, the leaves are just starting to come out. So normally we say when the lilacs bloom, put your crabgrass preventers down, but that would be too late. This year, we need to get that done uh, this week. Uh, by this weekend, you're probably gonna wanna have that done if possible. So, so once you get the product down and it's there doing its, doing its job, is there some cultural thing as far as mowing height to the grass throughout the summer that would help aid? Sure, that yeah, herbicide? yeah. If you want to just, uh, yeah, certainly a, a taller canopy uh, will help uh, crowd out some of those little tiny crabgrass seedlings uh, when they emerge, and some of those seedlings won't be able to survive as, if there's too much shade. So, uh, thicker mowing height, what two to four inches, I think, is what we normally shoot for on our mowing heights. Even if you live in one of those uh, low maintenance lawns out in the country, uh, it's still a still a good idea. So I used to always just stick my hand down, and if the grass came up to my knuckles, that was about right height. I figured. You bet. So, you uh, bet. And you know, if some of the crab crabgrass does come up, uh, you know, you want, might want to collect those clippings if you you know to prevent some of that seed from going back in. Some of those types of things. But generally, mowing heights good way to start to prevent those annual weeds. Okay. Mike, can okay. you get those products? alone or do you have to always get them with a the fertilizer? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, generally they are sold with fertilizer and make sure you're getting a weed and feed for crabgrass. There are weed and feeds for broadleaf weeds like dandelions as well and they won't do anything to the crabgrass. So make sure you're getting something for crabgrass. Uh, generally they are on a fertilizer which is kind of odd because generally fall is the best time to fertilize. Um, but uh, there are other options. If you look hard enough, you might be able to find them coated on a clay granule, which does not include the, the fertilizer. And you don't have to look too hard usually. Usually a lot of hardware stores will include those, uh, but you know, not quite as common as the fertilizer granules. Okay. Not to belabor the, the topic mm -hmm. too much longer, but, but Dave, if, if they're gonna use a combination product, could that be their first application mm -hmm. of fertilizer for the lawn without having to do a separate fertilizer and then a weed and feed combination right behind that? Right. In fact, I'd encourage people to <coughs> wait to put on that first application until now. Put it down with your crabgrass preventer. A lot of people are out there like in March trying to get that first fertilizer down and then they're complaining the first of April, oh, I've got to mow the lawn because it's getting so big. So avoid some of that issue, avoid some of that thatch buildup that you're going to get from that over fertilization. Wait until the middle of May to put that first application on with your crabgrass preventer and then for most people probably you don't need to really think about too much doing fertilizing until again in the fall. Okay, good. Some, well, some people go do a little overseeding too. How about that? Yeah. Putting on the overseeding after you put the crabgrass. Yeah, on. that's one of the, the negative aspects of the crabgrass preventers is that once you put those on, you really can't seed into your yard until this fall. And so keep that in mind. If you have some bare spots out there, you might want to go around those. Or some areas that you're going to try to seed in uh, here this spring yet, uh, go around those areas. Okay. A topic that has many facets oh, related to there's it. There's always a plus and a minus. <laughs> yeah. Bet. Okay, good. Well, thank you, panel. Before we get to our questions, we want to hear from Dennis Toddy, our Extension State Climatologist. As he talks about the weather this spring, Dennis asks the question, has it really been a cool, wet spring? Dennis? This is State Climatologist Dennis Toddy with this week's Garden Line Climate Minute. It's been a cool and wet spring. Everybody knows that. We've talked recently about how cool it's been compared to average. But has it really been wet? Well, let's look at that picture just a little bit more. The image you see here shows how precipitation has compared since April 1st across the state. And you can see over about the last six weeks, precipitation has actually been a fair amount less than average over a good portion of the state. From a large area from southwest to central to northeast across the state, we really have had below average precipitation. 
Now, obviously, flooding has been an issue. A lot of that is a carryover from last year's precipitation and snowfall over the winter, and then some carryover from precipitation in other parts of the state. So over the short term, we have not been that wet overall. This is likely to change again as we have another storm system coming over us during the mid to late part of this week, where western to central parts of the state could get some fairly large precipitation amounts. Look for some potential flash floods and impacts on some of your garden planting. This information and other links to precipitation information can be found on our website at climate.sdstate.edu. All right. Well, thank you, Dennis, for that information. So, well, panel, let's get to our questions. From Castlewood, John, you mentioned wood ticks. No wood ticks in South Dakota until recently. Why are they here now? Now, I'm not sure if that means this time of year or in South Dakota as a whole, but maybe uh, Castlewood has not had much experience with ticks, but uh, yeah, yeah, they seem to be. Well, you know, I think there might be a couple parts to that question. Um, the Whatever you want to call them is a common name. The wood ticks, American dog ticks, it's the same thing, it's just different common names for them. Have been here, as far as I know, as long as there have been animals living here. Uh, part of the bigger reason why we might not have seen quite as many is that these things tend to feed on rodents when they're larvae and nymphs, and then as adults they feed on larger animals, the dogs, deer, humans, and we've seen a, a tremendous increase in our deer population in particular. And so as you get some of those larger mammals increasing in numbers, you're likely to see more of them around. And the other thing is, is we do a habitat modification. So we give them more of those edges that they like to live in, those uh, transitions from grasslands to wooded areas. It creates really favorable habitat for them, and we may see more of them in some of those areas. All right. David from Sioux Falls. Grass. They think it's Carl Forrester. Is it too late to cut that back, and how short should they cut that if they do? I would cut it back as, as close as you can to that new growth that's coming up. You're going to see a lot of fresh new growth, or green blades coming up from the base of that plant. Ideally, you're going to cut it back, say, a month ago or so, so that you don't have that dead grass in with the fresh grass. But you can still go in there and take out a lot of that old dead growth. It's going to improve the appearance of the plant for the rest of the season. Hey, from Chamberlain, Larry. Dead grass plots, two feet long, looks like mildew. Mm -hmm. What do I do? The rest of the lawn is green. Okay. Uh, could be powdery mildew this time of year. Is it really perfect for powdery mildew on the bluegrass lawn? Uh, the poor light conditions and then the relatively wet, cool weather uh, tends to favor powdery mildew in those shaded areas. Uh, so it could be that this particular area of the lawn is not uh, uh, receiving as much light or air movement as it could. That's if it is powdery mildew. Now, another uh, possibility here is just what we talked about, maybe a little bit of excessive uh, thatch in that area uh, or some other problems going on. A good sample would help us pinpoint the problem. But if it is a small patch, uh, again, good time to get in there and check that thatch layer. If you've got more than about a half inch of, uh, of that root material and dead tissue before you get to the soil line, uh, it's likely it's impeding the water and the nutrients and the roots are dying off. So a little bit of winter kill and some other things may have uh, affected that area. Okay. So if it looks like it's dead, all brown, no green coming up through there, should they scrape that off and reseed? Need to, do, need to do some sort of renovation, yeah. If you don't have any live crowns and there's no green growth coming back, you have a dead spot. Get rid of that uh, and, and reseed, maybe cover it with a little bit of something to protect the soil uh, this time of year, but keep it watered and uh, you should have grass in no time. Okay. Uh, David, lilacs. I have flowers at the top of the bushes, but no leaves on the bottom. Uh, or Larry as well, Are there any, is this a disease? Do they need to fertilize chemicals, or what should they do? They don't say how tall they are, though, or well, if they're shaded. And that might... A common issue with lilacs is they take, keep getting taller and taller and taller. Uh, John Ball did a segment on forsythia pruning a couple, several weeks ago. We talked about pruning the forsythias after they're done blooming, taking out a third of those biggest, oldest shoots down close to the ground, allowing fresh new shoots to come up from the bottom. Lilacs bloom on wood that's probably two or three years old or so uh, to start with, but then they'll bloom on, the, on last year's wood after that. So as that plant keeps growing, that place where they bloom keeps getting higher and higher. Uh, it's not uncommon for the flowers to come out first and then the foliage to come out after that, so I wouldn't be too worried yet if you're not seeing a lot of leaves. Uh, those flower buds tend to open up first and then the leaf buds uh, develop a little bit later on. So give them some time, I wouldn't be too excited about it, but if they're getting really big, think about doing some pruning after they're done blooming now this spring. Take out a few of those big old stems right down close to the base. 
And uh, if you do that each year, you'll have a smaller plant with lots more flowers. This comes from Wakanda. And while we're on the topic of uh, lilacs, and they indicate that an answer to someone's question last week, lilacs, uh, not to wilt when cut, uh, break them off, take a hammer and pound the stems to help them draw up more water. I disagree with that. Okay. Uh, essentially what you're doing by pounding those stems is you're just destroying that vascular tissue. Think of that vascular tissue almost as like a little bunch of little tubes and what you've done now is you've smashed all those tubes closed. You'll hear that recommended as a, a way to keep them from wilting and not just for lilacs but other plants too, but I, I think it's the wrong approach. I think just to, if you cut them and bring them inside, recut the stems again, cut another couple inches off those stems and get them in some lukewarm water right away. If you have some floral preservative, use some of that in there. I think that's going to help to get that water uptake. But recutting the stems with a good sharp pruning shears is kind of the opposite approach of smashing it with a hammer. But I think it's going to be better for you. Okay. Good. Rapid City, bees. Uh, John or Dave here, could you give me a bee-friendly list of plants in Zone 4? Favorable perennials and annuals we can plant to attract them. And by chance, is there a published list of such a list of plants? Well, they're certainly going to be attracted to many, many different kinds of plants. Bees are pretty opportunistic. They're going to go after pretty much whatever they can find that's in bloom. Uh, as opposed to butterflies, which like to have a broader landing surface, like daisy-type flowers. Uh, probably one of my favorite plants that is really attractive to bees are the sedums, especially like Autumn Joy sedum, an old favorite plant. That thing is a, especially a bumblebee magnet for those uh, insects in the fall of the year. But really, I think having a variety of plants going to be blooming throughout the season probably would be a good approach. Right. The key is going to be getting that progressive bloom through the season and having one thing transition into another. You know, at this time of year, most of our bees, both the wild bees and honey bees, are visiting dandelions. And as much as our weed guys might not like to hear that, that's really going to be about one of the best things for them right now. We get just a little bit later and, and they move into a lot of other different kinds of flowers and really most of those bees for a nutrition standpoint need a variety of things. You, if you have just all of one thing they won't do very well so you need a variety of flowers and if you've got a wide range they'll do much better. Okay, good. Well at this time Guardline visited a greenhouse with David Graper Extension horticultural specialist to learn about annuals. Dave explains which varieties are good choices to plant in sunny areas. Last week we focused on plants that are tolerant of shady conditions. This week we're going to focus on plants that really like it out in the sun. Of course, petunias have probably been one of the most popular plants adapted to the sunny locations. And there's been a lot of work with petunias over the years, many of them working with uh, groups of plants called the wave series. There's all different kinds of wave plants. But uh, the big difference with these is that they produce a lot of flowers, they spread out over a large area, and just bloom all summer long. A related group of plants are the calibracoas, which also spread out. Sometimes they're called million bells because of the lots of tiny, small flowers that they have. Again, a great plant out there in the sun. Salvias have been another very popular plant. Of course, there are many different types of salvias out there that do well in the sun, or in cases, part shade. But there's some new ones that are coming out that are really you know, a showstopper as far as the bright blue and reds and pinks and whites in the flowers. So look for some of those. Another very important group of plants that is relatively new to the greenhouse scene are the angelonias, or summer snapdragons. Unlike the typical snapdragons that kind of weaken when it gets too hot and dry, these plants like the heat. They come in upright forms as well as trailing forms in quite a wide variety of colors, and they again will bloom pretty much all season long. Another important area for the sun is to use some of those attractive foliage plants. This is purple night. Alternanthera, big, bright, bold, dark colored foliage, really a neat accent plant to uh, set, show off some of those other plants that might be in the garden. Another neat plant that uh, is gaining more popularity are the lantanas. These come in again a wide variety of flowers, like it hot, really good produce, or producing flowers all season long once again. Another relatively new plant are the ornamental millets. Purple Majesty was an All-America winner uh, a couple years ago. A new one that's just come out is called Purple Baron. It's much like Purple Majesty, but it only gets about two feet tall instead of the three or four feet tall that we see with the large ornamental millet. 
Sweet potato vine is another one that's been pretty popular. Greens, burgundies, and variegated foliage like this, again, good in sun and also will tolerate part sun. Very interesting plant for a container uh, or for an area where that can cascade down the side. And lastly, I wanted to point out some of the new dianthus that have come out. Uh, typically, I think of dianthus as kind of a cool season plant. There's a bunch of newer dianthus that are hybrids with uh, sweet williams that give you beautiful cut flower stems, about two feet tall, bloom all summer long if you keep cutting them back. Wonderful plants for that sunny garden. Well, hey, thank you for that little video spot, Dave. Do you have any follow-up comments you want to make about anything? Well, I just invite you to come out to McCrory Gardens this summer. We've got over 100 different trial varieties that we're putting out in the gardens this year, things from all different kinds of companies around. around and uh, there's many, many new things that are coming out that are just really great. I, I showed you some good examples there, but there's so many other new plants out there. Uh, and patients that are good for the sun, the sun patients are a great plant to think about. The, uh, all the sun coleus that are out there now are just fantastic. There's just, there's just way too many to even mention, so you've got to come out to McCrory and visit us and, and take a look and get some See ideas. See the real thing That's right. out there. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, and as always, we have viewers that email in questions and even pictures of some of the, the issues that they have. And the first one this week uh, comes to us from Pier, and it's a small clover with yellow flowers. It is a new grass seeding that this is in. Uh, however, the grass really isn't showing up much yet. We would like to know if we should spray it, and if so, what kind of spray should we spray with, or should we leave it? Is it going to add any kind of nitrogen to the soil? Mike, you want to take that one? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a clover. It looks like black medic, uh, an annual uh, type clover. Uh, you know, and clovers fix nitrogen, but this is not really going to, you know, enhance your soil in any way, and really, it's really not going to do you any good at all. Uh, so you just planted your grass, and now you have these weeds coming up. Should you spray? And you know, probably not. You know, and you want to be watching. I mean, if your grasses are coming up, and we kind of talked about reseeding earlier, if you you know, with the crabgrass preventers. But if you do seed in early this spring, uh, if you had that new grass seedling coming up, you can't spray any broadleaf herbicides on that grass, or the grass will die. Uh, so uh, you might want to be watching if you have grasses coming up, uh, really all you can really do is mow those weeds down and eventually the grasses will kind of take over and dominate. Uh, if you don't have any grasses coming up um, you know, and you want to reseed, you're probably going to have to spray something like that's non-selective like a Roundup or glyphosate product and then reseed. I imagine we're getting a little bit late uh, for seeding, especially kind of in the pure area. Luckily you've been catching a lot of moisture lately right. so that will help. Um, but uh, so if you're going to make that decision, probably have to make that decision fairly quick. All right. Those warm season grasses are going to start. You mentioned the crabgrass earlier. That stuff is going to start germinating too, and it, it can be really tough to get a good lawn established when you're combating all those weeds. Right, right. But uh, but no no broadleaf herbicides uh, for that. Uh, even if you're going to reseed, uh, still no broadleaf herbicide. You want to use like a Roundup or non-selective herbicide, and then you could reseed. Uh, you know, the day after you spray the Roundup if you want. Okay. Or till it and remove those annuals that way. These are just annual species, so just a shallow tillage uh, would remove them as well. Mainly do something before they go to seed. Yeah, yeah right, yep. right. If no grasses are coming yep. up. Yep. If the grasses are coming up, all you can do is mow. Okay. Uh, from Watertown, Dave, can you tell me how soon we can transplant tulips after they have bloomed? Well, the best answer is probably not until about August. Uh, you want to let that foliage fully mature, turn yellow, and die, dry down on its own. I know sometimes it can get a little ugly, so I'd encourage you to plant your tulips in with some other plants or sprinkle some flower seed in amongst your tulips to get some color there after the tulips are dying down. But if you really want to try to get a good uh, return crop of flowers next year, you need to let that foliage mature. Now that's not to say that you can't move them right after they're done blooming, but it's going to stress the plants. You probably aren't going to have much for flowers and you might just be better off just buying new bulbs and planting those as opposed to trying to move existing plants. When you say that foliage, the leaves that are there that are green mm -hmm. are using the sun to produce food that goes in the right. next year's bulb. Right, that builds up the carbohydrate storage in that bulb to fuel the production of a good flower stalk that next year. And if you don't have that build up, the bulb gets a little smaller. You might not even get any flowers or maybe just a big leaf or two. We often see that with tulips. 
Uh, if the foliage gets cut down or it gets too hot too quickly in the season, we often see that in South Dakota. The second year the tulips come back and they don't bloom as well after three or four years, you might not get hardly any flowers. So tulips are really kind of iffy and if you start moving around, you're gonna really jeopardize that. I think if you're gonna spend the effort in putting bulbs in the ground, you might as well start with fresh bulbs in the fall. Okay, uh, Mike, you alluded to this a little bit ago. Uh, as far as when is the best time of year to spray for dandelions, now or until fall? Yeah, and so dandelions are perennial, so with any of our perennial weeds, fall is the best time. And dandelions are really susceptible to those fall herbicide applications. So that's going to be the best time. Now, the dilemma is, though, is your dandelions are flowering now and are going to be producing seed. You want, you want to stop that seed production. So it, you could you know, make some herbicide applications now to, pr to suppress seed production, but keep in mind, you're probably not gonna kill the plants. That'll be uh, done more effectively with a fall herbicide application. So, uh, so you can spray now for, if you want suppression, uh, otherwise in fall, but if you spray now, uh, just watch out. A lot of these herbicides can volatilize and we got leaves coming out on the trees. Uh, they can be uh, damaged by some of these vapors coming off from these broadleaf herbicides. So spot treat if you can. Uh, if you're broadcast uh, spraying, just be real careful. And that's important to understand. You got droplet drift. In other words, the spray itself moving to a plant that you don't want it to get on. But the vapors can do that as well if you're not careful. So right, a very a different double. thing. Yeah, the vapors will slowly come off and then at night or something like that, they can move move over the garden or onto your flowers or something like that and, and cause problems there. So then that's another reason why fall herbicide applications are a lot safer. Okay, uh, John, we got a series of emails, that uh, question that came in and two questions that came in tonight dealing with grubs. Uh, in the in past years, I have an area in my lawn that seems to get grub damage. I notice when it, conditions get hot and dry in the fall, it really shows up. Uh, this year, I want to prevent it. I want to use a minimum amount of chemicals. What insecticide should I use? When should I apply that? And basically, kind of the same question here. Granular product says can be applied between May to August. Is it okay to put it on now? Uh, is there chemical control for grub control products that will take care of them? Uh, in my lawn. So three questions all related to dealing with grubs. Okay, well let's start out with this. All of these have been called grubs here and I think first thing we want to talk just a little bit about is identification of those grubs because what I think of as grubs are different than what someone else might think of as grubs and even within the grubs we have some differences. We deal with both the the white grubs and the billbug larvae that people in lawns just refer to as grubs. There are some other insects as well too, but those are probably the common ones that get called grubs. Control issues for them are a little bit different. Timing is going to be different. All of the conditions that affect them are different. And then within the white grubs, assuming that you have the big C-shaped, uh, usually inch long or longer as mature larvae, um, if you have those white grubs out there, there are actually three common species or three common groups of species in South Dakota. We have our true white grubs, which take three years to mature, and they've got, they're the real large ones. They uh, turn into the June beetles that we see flying about this time of year, or starting to fly now. Then we have our annual white grubs, which are smaller. For the most part, we see those a little farther south and maybe farther west in the state. We don't see as many in the northeast corner, but they have a one-year life cycle probably not as problematic in a lawn as what the true white grubs are. And then we do have Japanese beetle, and depending on where those questions are coming from, we may be dealing with Japanese beetle in a lawn as well. And control on Japanese beetle will be different than the others, especially if we're looking at those organic type controls or non-chemical type controls. Because there are some products out there that work very well against some of these. Uh, milky spore would be one that's a, a natural product and is only effective against Japanese beetle. So if you've got Japanese beetle, it's a good one to, uh, to put on and, and try to control those a little bit. And that's one where if you get the live spores, it'll last for years in that lawn. For the others, um, you're probably looking at one of the, uh, uh, the nematodes, the predatory type nematodes for those larvae, or else you're looking at habitat modification or a chemical type control. And for the other chemical controls, this is a little early for any of those. I would really wait until later in the summer. You want to wait until those eggs are hatching and you get those very young larvae because these big larvae, assuming that they're white grubs, are hard to kill even with chemicals. Okay. Is there a growth regulator product that's out there? 
I guess I'm not aware of a, a growth regulator that's on the market in South Dakota right now. There are a number of granular type products that work very well and can be applied for those, but again, they're going to work better towards the, uh, the hatching stage of these things. They'll lay eggs after those June beetles fly, so if you watch your lights at night for those June beetles, mm -hmm. and, and uh, once they're done flying, then you can give it a couple weeks and you can count on those eggs starting to hatch. Okay. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dave, how do you, uh, one of the next of our uh, email questions that came in, how do you feel about chestnut trees? Will they fare in the Chamberlain area? Soil, clay, yard, setting with regular watering, uh, the trees are rated for zone four. I've been tempted to try some of them in my own yard, but I, I guess I wouldn't recommend them wholesale if you wanted to just try a tree or two. You probably need a couple trees if you're going to try to hope for nuts down the line, but uh, you know, we had chestnut blight that came through, I'm not sure how many decades ago that was, but so there's very few chestnuts that are left out in the country and we, they really aren't a tree that's very well adapted for this area, so I wouldn't recommend a whole scale planting of them, but you want to just try a tree or two. In Chamberlain, I'd say it's going to be pretty, pretty iffy. Okay. Mike, I live in the country and this is Westington Springs and have a problem with thistles in my lawn. Any suggestions on how to get rid of them? But they don't say what type of thistle for Yeah, so. right. And so just like the grub thing, it's, you know, it gets all complicated, you know, a simple problem. Uh, well, not quite as complicated as the grubs. Uh, if, you've, if your thistles are making uh, kind of large circular rosettes right now, uh, it's probably a biennial thistle. And then this is why it's, it's important to know if it's biennial or perennial. If making a large rosette is probably biennial. That thistle is only going to live two years, so continuous mowing is eventually going to, you know, that thistle is just going to die after two years. Uh, if it's a perennial thistle, like Canada thistle, it's probably not making the rosettes. It's probably little small little shoots and, and usually in a little patch since that spreads by roots and they're going to be a little bit smaller and a little bit more upright at this point. So that can make a difference. Um, you know, if you have those biennial thistles, you know, a little, uh, you can dig them out uh, or continuous mowing or spot treating with any of your typical broadleaf herbicides. Uh, Canada thistle is going to be a tough one. It's a perennial, so you gotta you gotta starve those roots eventually. And so uh, you could spot treat those with a, a broadleaf herbicide. But again, that's a perennial, so fall is going to be the best time to treat for Canada thistle. But you're not going to like those prickly things out there, and so spot treating will uh, will get them to wilt up. But keep in mind, those perennial thistles are going to be a long-term management process. So just kind of keep at it, spot treating uh, as necessary. Okay no easy solution on those perennial Canada thistles. So for biennial thistles, if they're spraying for their dandelions in the fall, they may as likely take care of their perennial or biennial thistles as That's well. right, yep, yep. It'll also control the biennial thistles, or if you're spraying now, it'll control biennial thistles now as well. And so they're, they're fairly susceptible to those broadleaf herbicides, so you can, you can control those. But usually there's not a lot of those biennial thistles in your yard, so that's a good one to spot treat. Uh, John from uh, Sioux Falls, and I'm going to give this to you because uh, I think you took the last question we had on this particular subject, and it deals with uh, dethatching the lawn because of night crawlers. Really rough surface, uh, even though they have a power rake that dethatch it, it just gets worse year after year. They really think it's uh, earthworm night crawlers. What can they do to make their lawn a little smoother? Yeah, well, that's going to be one of those. I think they're on the right track here, honestly, trying to get rid of some of that thatch and just decrease some of that organic material on the surface that attracts those earthworms or night crawlers up there to feed on that. You know, other than that, for longer term control, um, you know, a lot of those weed and feed type products have some or have seem to have some effect on decreasing some of those numbers over a number of years if you re routinely use some of those products. Uh, other than that, I guess I'm not sure how best to go about trying to eliminate earthworms in a setting like okay. that. And they are good, though, for the lawn, for aeration well, of the soil. and You know, I'm not, again, you might, you might be uh, addressing the earthworm problem. Uh, you know, start with the thatch and obviously uh, yeah. correct some of that uh, overcare maybe that's going on or, or uh, get the core aeration in there every year and the, the power raking maybe early fall. Um, that might correct the earthworm problem to some extent later on. Uh, making the area a little less hospitable. Okay. Uh, John, while well, I have you on, on uh, Batter's Box here, our neighbor had sprayed some Astro on their pine trees for beetle prevention. And this comes from Sturgis. It ended up on the compost in our fruit trees and where our, our asparagus is starting to grow. 
what effect will this have on them, especially the use of our compost? Right. Uh, you know, that's one of those where the issue here is really a systemic type action on this. And if it gets into that plant tissue and persists in there, there's, there'd be some question on some of that. Um, I guess, honestly, I'm not sure what half-lives or residual effect might be of, you know, astro in particular. But it'd be worth checking out to see a lot of those types of insecticides when they're applied as a foliar type spray bind fairly quickly with soils um, or are deactivated by contact with soils and really are not likely to persist in an, an environment for an extended period of time. If you're not seeing a lot of effect for those insects in those areas, if they're not killing off insects in those areas, you know, there's maybe some indication that they're not all that active anymore at that point either. But probably worth checking a, a label for Astro, looking that up and, and seeing what kind of residual effect it might have on those. Is there usually an 800 number on the label they could call the company as well, or? I just searched for it online yeah, this like morning, and I found the label online, and it is labeled for use on fruit trees, so that part of it probably isn't a concern. I'm not sure about the asparagus and the compost. I'd, if you're just mixing that in with the soil, I, I doubt it's going to probably be of too much concern, but it's not labeled for that kind of use, so kind of leaves it open. Right. Uh, Larry from Madison. Have you ever heard that morel mushrooms come up around the same time as the lilacs bloom? Getting yeah. kind of to our crabgrass well, yeah, question here. Well, yeah, we are there two things? We're getting fooled yeah. just like the crabgrass preventers, yeah. yes. Yeah. And they said if you have any other just morel mushroom related information, they'd like to hear. Yeah, sure, I bet, they would, I bet they'd like to know secret spots <laughs> and so forth, yeah. And you know, go ahead and send those in to me and I'll pass those along to this viewer. So uh, yeah, go ahead and send those on in. No. Uh, lilac uh, blooming is, um, that's the old, uh, uh, you know, farmer's almanac kind of tip. But just like with the crabgrass, you know, they're a little bit, maybe the earth gets a little warm, uh, and then when the cool spells hit, the lilacs tend to hold off. Uh, sometimes we're a little late. In a year like this, uh, by the time the lilacs are blooming, we're going to be too late for morels. The deer will have those grubbed off. Um, so get out there a little before the lilacs, I think. Um, if, the, if the sun's been out for several days and warmed that ground, quickly i think that's the cue but you know i'm not an expert either. i was told when the leaves on an oak tree are the size of a squirrel's ear there you go that's a good one that's a good one okay now i gotta find a squirrel, uh, kind of squirrel? yeah well usually they're around oak trees so you can find oak trees you might find a squirrel okay uh day from winter what's the right way to harvest asparagus and how far down do you cut or snap it off or cut below the dirt line or what do you suggest there well, I like to cut as close to the dirt line or even a little bit below if possible. Uh, you can buy a, a fancy asparagus knife, which is kind of like a, a sharpened a putty knife, essentially, and you just kind of jab that underneath the, the stem and you can cut it off that way. If you cut it off too high, you end up leaving these old stems behind and they kind of get in the way when the next spear comes out. And even when you cut the stems off in the fall after they've frozen, I try to cut those down as close to the ground as I can just to get them out of the way so they aren't going to be there. But uh, the spears this time of year, uh, when you cut that stem off, that stem, that fleshy stem is going to decay pretty quickly and not cause a problem. So, you know, just cut them down close to the ground. Some people like white asparagus where it's actually been blanched, so cover it up with straw. You can buy European blanched asparagus. I don't like the taste of it, but uh, just cut down close to the ground. You want that spear to probably be about six or eight inches long or so. If you let it get too tall, the quality goes down, you end up with a, a real tough bottom part to the stem. So keep them cut down. If they start getting to the size of a pencil or smaller, I'd say don't cut them. That plant needs to get rejuvenated. You need to build that plant up again before you can get some nice sized spears. I cut some tonight that the size of my thumb on some of them. So good asparagus for supper tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Bellingham, Minnesota, John. Apple trees, when and how often is it best to spray for insects on our apple trees? Well, we've talked a lot about bloom periods already tonight and had a question about bees. This is an important one when we're talking about insects to wait until after the petals have completely dropped for sure to put anything on because if you're trying to get a fruit crop otherwise off of it, you end up killing your pollinators and you don't get the fruit set that you had intended. Usually in South Dakota, and I don't know how it's going to work out this year, but usually it'd be that first part of July is when you'd want to start 
with a, an insecticide regimen to, to try to get ahead of those apple maggots and codling moth would be, usually be just a little bit before that but uh, we see more apple maggot than we see codling moth around here and uh, you have to do that every couple of weeks or if you do get a heavy rain and wash that insecticide off it'd be time to reapply. Okay, uh, two questions here Dave and we got a short time to answer those. Uh, is it too late to plant potatoes? And the other one is from the Black Hills. What's the ideal soil temperature for planting potatoes and onions? Well, it's definitely not too late. Uh, you know, some people think they have to plant potatoes on Good Friday, but sometimes Good Friday comes when the ground is still frozen around here. So I'd say go ahead and plant. I think you can even plant into you know the first part of June and still end up with a pretty decent crop of potatoes. I don't know, Larry, from your background. No, I think yeah, no, I think good, good time. Yep. So plenty of time. Potato yet. beetles. All right. Well, that's all the time we have this evening. So just to let you know, Garden Line does repeat twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting Digital Channel 3, also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listings to find SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. Now as we wrap up, we want to thank our panel of experts, John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, SDSU Horticulture Department Head and Extension Horticulturalist, Larry Osborne, Extension Plant Pathologist, and Mike Meckning, Extension Weed Specialist. Thanks to our phone volunteers, the folks from Brookings Area Master Gardeners, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. On behalf of the entire crew, have a good evening and happy gardening. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications.